Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here with another China History Podcast. Today we're doing part six of our Cultural Revolution Overview. In our overly long episode last time, we ended with the Wuhan incident of July 20th, 1967, and the subsequent torching of the British Embassy in Beijing. There are so many milestones and defining moments in the Cultural Revolution that finally led to this summer of 1967 when Mao's mass movement started to go off the rails in a big way. This led to all kinds of sometimes desperate efforts to get everything back under control. And remember, at the same time, the party center always had to make it look like this, you know, no matter how bad it was, was all normal and find out ways to spin every disaster so that it, you know, looked like a great success. One of Chairman Mao's specialties, fortunately, with all the social and political chaos, and now chaos in the military as well, it finally got so bad that even Mao allowed Zhou Enlai to talk him out of continuing on with this whole thing, at least in the manner in which Mao was carrying things out. And it all sort of built up to this moment when the party center saw that they were losing that comfortable feeling of control that they always enjoyed since day one. Not only were they losing control of the military, but even the masses started to ignore orders. Before 1966, it would have been unthinkable to ignore anything, major or minor for that matter, that came from the party center in Beijing. Nothing carried more weight than that. Yet by the summer of 1967, when Mao, Zhou, and the CCRG are trying to pour water on the fire, they just can't put it out. These Red Guards and hooligans and everyone else out having a good time weren't going to allow these good times to end. The future they faced, going back to where they came from, was a dismal thought for many. Once you taste that forbidden fruit, how can you possibly go back to the drudgery from whence you came? Was it only two years before, in early 1965, that Mao started making a big deal about Wuhan's play? It all led to this. The calamity Mao was facing in the summer of 1967 was the result of events he set in motion when he decided to go after the top party leadership and blow things up in China for the sake of continuing the revolution. You remember in part one, Mao had bolted from Beijing in October of 1965 and planned his next move from the south. By April of 66, Peng Zhen and his entire lineup were overthrown. Mao's planning was so far so good. But May 25th, 1966, Nie Yuanzi puts up that Dazi Bao in Peking Yu, and the next thing you know, it's July 16th, and Mao is swimming in the mighty Yangtze, the symbolic line of demarcation between northern and southern China. In August 1966, the 11th plenum puts in a new lineup in Beijing, and all the while, Mao is tightening the noose on all his targets. And then August 5th, 1966, Mao lets fly his first Datsu Bao, saying, bombard the headquarters, and this is followed up a couple weeks later with that first of eight rallies, and it's at the first one on August 18th that Song Bin Bin puts the Red Guard armband on Mao. And then everyone is on the go, and the whole cultural revolution is off and running. One by one, all of Mao's opponents, or who he thought were his opponents, are all kicked out and replaced with a totally all-Mao-friendly lineup. Red Guards and anyone out for a good time are taking the destruction of the Four Olds to heart, much to the chagrin of museum curators, families, and other lovers of Chinese culture in China. January 28, 1967, Mao's eight-point order gives the PLA the power to bash heads and maintain order. The Shanghai Commune and the whole power seizure in Shanghai happens in the same month. Then came the February countercurrent, followed by Mao's ten-point order of April 6th, where the chairman makes a complete turnaround from his earlier eight-point order, and now the PLA is under attack from within and without. Summer of 1967, for the sake of setting up revolutionary committees to replace the traditional party committees, power seizures are going on all over China, some succeeding, most failing. But it was chaos nonetheless and violence of the worst kind. 
You had the Wuhan incident, July 20th, and then the burning and looting of the British embassy a month later. And the cherry on top was that by August 67, all the leftists, rebels, and no doubt other riffraff as well, were all armed, courtesy of Chairman Mao. And so we pick up from there. From about April to September of 1967, Liu Shaoqi had been getting savaged. Although no one is printing his name in the official party press, there's plenty of ranting about China's Khrushchev and the top party person taking the capitalist road. No mistake who they're talking about, ever. But not until his name is printed in the official party press or other organs of communication is it 100% official. August 14, 1967, a week before the British embassy got torched, in a People's Daily and Red Flag editorial, you can't get more official than that, Liu Shaoqi is accused of mainly three things. Undermining the socialist system for decades, trying to turn the CPPCC and NPC into a bourgeois-style bicameral parliament, and failing to support Mao at Lushan during the whole Peng Dehuai affair. Now, everyone was screaming for Liu's head louder than ever before. The steady drumbeat that had been going on, lightly at first, since 1964-1965, was now reaching a crescendo. Mobs showed up regularly outside Chongnanhai, demanding to struggle Liu. They would soon get their chance, and not only Liu, but his wife, Wang Guangmei, would face the most brutal and degrading struggle sessions. It all worked out well for Chairman Mao. He wanted to get rid of Liu and his whole power base. And their power base, you know, were the party committees. The party committees were replaced in most cases with revolutionary committees. And these revolutionary committees were all loyal to Mao. The Red Guards had been the facilitators, in a way, of these revolutionary committees. And we saw in the last episodes, these Red Guards, through the very chaos they created played a huge role in toppling the status quo and pushing everything out of the way for Mao to make his comeback. But what to do about the Red Guards? They were all wound up and committing all their atrocities, and I guess you could say they were doing everything Mao asked them to do, and then some. But now that Mao had what he wanted, who in the heck needed these Red Guards anymore? They were now starting to make them look bad. Mao couldn't have been too happy about all the blowback from allowing the... Red Guards to create such havoc when they took over the foreign ministry in June of 1967. They destroyed records and carried out enough destruction to completely throw China's foreign relations into utter disarray. In addition to being a movement targeting intellectuals, the Cultural Revolution was also all about anti-foreign, anti-imperialism. And even though Zhou Enlai signed off on the ultimatum that was given to the British Embassy you know, before they, before it was burned down, he hadn't expected that what happened later would happen. So now these Red Guards were becoming a total embarrassment, and they had to go. One of the holiest of holies of the CCP was and remains the control of pretty much everything. But now the Red Guards had become this center of power that operated outside the control of the party. Many times, orders came straight from the party center. And the Red Guards, you know, said, yeah, right, sure, you know. And they ignored orders, even when they came from Mao and Zhou. So finally, even Mao saw this problem. Although I'm sure Premier Zhou had to pull out all the stops to finally get the chairman to listen to his voice of reason. So Mao decided to turn on them. But how to turn off the switch? How to wind this down? There wasn't anyone who could possibly say what had to be said except Zhou Enlai. He was the only one standing who still had the street cred to tell the Red Guards and everyone else playing the game that it was all over. He did this on September 1st, 1967. In this announcement, the Premier orders them to cease their revolutionary activity, abandon violence, and stop attacking foreigners, and basically to go home. Zhou Enlai then met with a select group of Red Guard leaders and told them on September 17th he had a message from Chairman Mao saying the, the little 
Revolutionary generals, you know, is what he called them, had begun making mistakes, and it was time to hang it all up and go back to their studies. And their studies, moving forward in 67, 68, was very, very heavy on the anti-West, anti-imperialist propaganda, as well as, you know, high on the sayings of Chairman Mao. Now came time for the party to reestablish control over all the power they had given away that was now challenging their supremacy of the CCP and the central state apparatus. And at the same time, Mao had to find someone or some group to blame for the ultraviolence that had gotten so out of hand. And the scapegoats ended up being a roll call for almost everyone in the CCRG who had somehow helicoptered up from relative obscurity to great heights of power. Now, Jiang Qing, Kang Sheng, Chen Bo Da, Yao Wenyuan, and others, you know, they were safe for the time being. They'd have blame heaped on them another time. For now, it was time to go on the attack against those who had themselves been on the attack since the very beginning. In what became known as the May 16th Conspiracy, the party center accused these May 16th plotters of taking advantage of divisions within the movement to foment violence and anarchy in order to create an environment where the so-called proletarian headquarters of Chairman Mao could be overthrown and power over the state could be seized. And so, as it often happens in these totalitarian systems where doublespeak and all kinds of strange ways of explaining things are such a high art, these ultra-leftist troublemakers who went just a little too far in their enthusiasm to create revolution, well... Now they became known as counter-revolutionary rightists, who were only ultra-left in form, but ultra-right in essence. The hunt for these so-called May 16th elements was carried out nationwide beginning in the fall of 67. And a lot of people who got caught up in this dragnet were either extremely inconvenienced or killed. The first three to get nailed were Guanfeng, Qi Yu, and Wang Li who we recall from the last episode. Wang Li was the one who was kidnapped by the Million Heroes during the Wuhan incident and who was able to get back to Beijing alive and be welcomed on the tarmac at Capitol Airport by Zhou Enlai himself. And who had that, he had that, uh, Wang Li had that big rally in Tiananmen Square to welcome him back with the Xie Fu Jie. A hero on one day, and now so soon after his great moment, he's now a villain. Now, Mao had second thoughts about Qi Ban Yu, so he let him go for the time being, but Qi is going to get it a short time later. Qi Ban Yu was a hardcore, radical, propagandist, speechwriter, and attack dog who helped to facilitate the downfall of the highest party leaders targeted by Mao. He had that, that golden pen and knew how to write these scathing attacks in the party mouthpieces. Guan Feng also uh, was another of Mao and the CCRG's attack dogs. Now it was their turn to be on the receiving end of this madness still going on. So this whole May 16th conspiracy, you know, it wasn't really a conspiracy. It was just a kind of a mechanism that made it convenient to deliver these trumped up charges against all these sacrificial lambs and heap as much blame as possible on them. All the stuff that got out of hand and began to actually threaten the leadership of Mao were all blamed on them. So on August 25th, 1968, Mao said they had to go. On August 30th, the pair Wang Li and Guan Feng, they both had to face their former CCRG colleagues. And it was prearranged that Kang Sheng would lead the attack against Wang Li and Chen Bo Da would twist the knife inside Guan Feng. And as was her style and her prerogative, Jiang Qing led her own attack against both of them. So we see here the CCRG is cannibalizing itself already. And then by order of the three holiest organs of power, the party, the CCRG, and the state council, the army is called in to restore order. Now, everyone who was handed a gun or a rifle when Mao came up with his wild idea to arm the left, they all had to be returned. And furthermore, these hotheads who at one time had Mao's blessing were told to stand back and not interfere with the army's restoration of order. And so began the attack on these so-called ultra-leftists who were now being attacked for doing the dirty work of Mao and the CCRG. 
well, you know, they had served their purpose and now they had become a liability. So they were labeled a typical counter-revolutionary organization. And all the factional violence that they carried out in the terrible summer of 1967 was blamed on them, or officially blamed on what was referred to as the May 16th Corps. May 16th, by the way, was the date in 1966 that Mao issued the circular that first announced the uh, Cultural Revolution. So like I said, it was easy to turn the Red Guards on, but not easy to turn them off. Many Red Guard units refused to disband and dared to defy orders. These youngins were the hardest core of the leftists. They stood up to whoever told them to stand down, even the party center. Now, six months ago, they would have gotten away with this, but not now. No one was in the mood anymore for what had just happened. Now, in January of 1968, Mao was washing his hands of these Red Guards, and under the bus they go. In France... In July of 1794, you had the Thermidorian reaction that spelled curtains for the radicals, you know, Robespierre, Saint-Just, and their ilk. Now in China, their own homegrown Thermidorian reaction was revving up, and the order of the day was to retreat from this ultra-radicalism. To show they were serious, the authorities staged many a public execution to drive home the point what fate waited for those who wanted to keep on going when Mao was saying, enough. Schools and universities began to open a few weeks later, but as I said, the new syllabus was heavy on the pro-Mao thought, anti-West, anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist speak. And what about the majority of people who just tried to get by? Those who weren't Red Guards or terribly active in the campaign, they had spent... The past couple of years trying to blend in and, you know, participate only as much as they absolutely had to in order to avoid trouble. By the spring of 68, these people could start to breathe a little bit easier. By then, the worst was over, though plenty of bad still remained and lie ahead. That bizarre carnival atmosphere where there was little law and definitely no order seemed in the past. In July of 1968, Mao himself summoned student leaders for a private audience, and there he told them, tearfully it said, that it was all over for the Red Guards. And when the students walked away from that encounter with the Great One, I wonder if they felt they had been used in a big way. The PLA was back to busting heads again, and anyone who didn't fall into line or thought 1966 was going to go on forever got beaten, killed, or incarcerated. But most all, they got sent down. Sent down to the countryside, to the villages, to anywhere but the cities and towns. The students who, in August 1966, were on top of the world, at least in China, found themselves facing a very cruel fate indeed. They all had to shang shan xia xiang, go up to the mountains and down to the countryside. They were being sent down to learn from the peasants and face a very uncertain future. Ostensibly, they were being sent down to learn from the peasants, but the reality was they were being sent as far away as possible, out into the sticks where they couldn't cause any trouble. And mind you, as I mentioned, they had already had a brief but concentrated taste of the good life, traveling around the country, being the center of attention. This was quite a bitter pill for all those sent down. A lot of them are still there today. Between 1967 and 1979, something like 12 million urban youth were sent down to the countryside. The total number of so-called rusticated, educated youth numbered around 16,470,000. The cities from which most of these youth were sent down were, of course, Beijing and Shanghai, but also Tianjin, Hangzhou, Nanjing, Wuhan, and Chengdu, also Chongqing. The lucky ones at least got to stay in their own province, but most, they were sent to the notorious how shall we say, rough and lesser desirable parts of China. This was Inner Mongolia, Xinjiang, Yunnan, Heilongjiang. But as we'll see later, sending all these hot-headed red guards to the countryside did not end the fighting or violence. It just 
It just shifted it into a new form. So suffice to say, finally, at last, more or less, the whole Red Guard movement is kaput by the autumn of 1968. And so comes the next major milestone of these cultural revolution time. This was the 12th plenum, held in Beijing, October 13th to 31st, 1968. This was the first one since April 1966, when Mao first went on the attack. This session was a big one. Not only did it include the Central Committee, but also present for the meeting were surviving CCRG members and the heaviest hitters still standing from the PLA in the provinces. By 1968, Mao had cleared the decks of any and all perceived opponents to his leadership and authority. So this particular plenum's purpose was to legitimize everything Mao had done after he cleaned house in the party. And the signature event of Mao's house cleaning was the purging of Liu Shaoqi and Deng Xiaoping. The plenum approved a document that completely and without reservation denounced Liu Shaoqi. And by the way, the ones who were tasked to write this denunciation were the team of Kangsheng and Jiang Qing. Boy, those two had sure come a long way since their younger days together back in Shandong. Pinned on Liu are all the crimes that had before only just been inferred. You know, like China's Khrushchev, renegade, traitor, scab, hiding in the party, lackey of imperialism, modern revisionism, and KMT reactionaries. You know, five months after this plenum is the Ninth Party Congress that opened on April 1st, 1969. This is the historic Congress where Lin Biao is officially made Mao's chosen successor. And it's also at this Congress that Jiang Qing, Kang Sheng, the cream of the CCRG are all given seats on the Politburo. This was a, <laughs> this was a very deeply divided Politburo. The purge of Liu and Deng was ratified, and that puts an exclamation point on that whole thing that had been dragging on since the time of Hai Rui Ba Guan in, in 1965. Liu was permanently expelled from the party. Liu Shaoqi today has been fully rehabilitated and pretty much viewed as a good guy in modern Chinese history and the poster person for a persecuted victim. He tragically died in a dank prison cell in Kaifeng in Henan province on November 12th, 1969. The story of his last year and how he was allowed to slowly waste away, denied medicine, denied medical treatment for his diabetes and any kind of comfort. This is a cruel and heartbreaking story that he was posthumously rehabilitated, you know, hardly can compensate for what Mao subjected his old comrade to. As we all know, Deng Xiaoping, although he was disgraced and had to endure no small amount of humiliation and personal tragedy, was to a degree protected by Mao and didn't suffer the same fate as Liu Shaoqi. A new party constitution was written and approved. Kang Sheng was instrumental in the drafting of this document, so you could be sure it was heavy on style and light on substance, and it elevated Mao Zedong thought to the same astronomical heights of Marxism-Leninism. Kang not only made it into the Politburo, he also got into the Standing Committee. The Standing Committee of the Ninth Party Congress had only five members, and these were the most powerful men in China. You had Kang Sheng and you know, the other four, of course, were Mao and Zhou Enlai, and rounding out the uh, Standing Committee were Lin Biao and Chen Boda. This was an all-Mao-friendly lineup put in place at the Jiu Da, the Ninth Party Congress. The military was never more represented than in this new Central Committee lineup. From the Ninth Party Congress, the Cultural Revolution would still drag on for seven more years. On June 17, 1967, China had detonated their first thermonuclear device, and this didn't do anything to warm Sino-Soviet relations. To say that relations were frosty and frigid between these two during the Cultural Revolution would not do the words justice. 
I haven't mentioned much about Sino-Soviet relations because this is a very big future topic here on the China History Podcast. We've touched on relations between these two giant neighbors in previous podcasts, but we'll focus in on the history of Russian and later Soviet relations with China you know, at a different time. By the time of the Ninth Party Congress, Russia had about a million troops along the 2,500-mile-long border with China. On March 2nd, 15th, and 17th, 1969, we'll see the famous shootout between Soviet and Chinese troops on the Usuri River up in the extreme northeast on Demansky Island, also known as uh, Junbalta. Intensive Soviet firepower blasted away on the Chinese side after what was most likely a Chinese-instigated fight. Then again in July, there's another major flare-up near Khabarovsk in the northeast corner of China, and it wasn't just in Manchuria. Out in the northwest, where Xinjiang bordered the Soviet Union, you know, to the west and to the north, there was also a whole lot of tension, not to mention military skirmishes. This, amidst everything else going on, weighed very heavy on Mao's mind. Zhou Enlai met with Alexei Kosygin, who I think we can call the Zhou Enlai of Russia, and these two very professional and experienced statesmen tried to cool things down between, you know, the two great powers. They met at uh, Beijing Airport on 9-11, 1969. This didn't do anything to put a lid on the tensions, and, you know, whatever Kosygin would say would be manipulated in such a way as, you know, to provide maximum disinformation value. You know, once things began to fall apart in the late 50s and early 60s, it really never recovered between China and the Soviet Union. China and Russia, you know, they had to start all over, and, you know, now, you know, they maintain good relations. In February of 1969, Mao had called on his four marshals, Chen Yi, Xu Xiangqian, Nie Rongzhan, and Ye Jianying, to take stock of China's general strategic position with respect to foreign relations. It was this team who first came up with the idea that the Soviet Union was actually China's main enemy, not the USA. This act by Mao, to ask the advice of these four trusted men, you know, who are still in a state of semi-disgrace, that got the ball rolling. That culminated in the visit to China of Richard Nixon, couple years later. Throughout 1968 and into 1969, as the flames of the Mao cult burned white hot, China was still convulsing from all the witch hunts, anarchy, and factional fighting still going on. Red Guards may have been defanged, but that didn't mean the killing everywhere stopped. Industry and commerce was severely degraded. The production figures weren't anything like what you saw during the Great Leap Forward, but things were a mess. Mao had gone and done something totally stupid, well, in retrospect, but at the time, eh, maybe it seemed like a good idea. Just as Mao was starting to plan his cultural revolution, there was this sense of clear and present danger of possible Soviet attack or attack by other imperialists. Mao didn't want to see China's industrial infrastructure, you know, mostly located along the coastal provinces, fall into imperialist hands or be affected by any invasion or nuclear attack from the Soviet Union or the USA. So they created this third front or third line of defense way out in the West where, you know, it was thought to be safe from attack. Historical experience proved that the deeper you went into China, the harder it was for invaders to fight. As the Japanese learned in the 1930s and 40s, the coast and central China might fall, but forget about the west and the southwest. It was too far, too rugged, and too hard to hold on if they, if they could take any cities. So all this industry got moved west. I mean, they stopped production, disassembled whole plants, and loaded up everything on railroad cars and moved entire industries way, way inland to be unloaded and set up somewhere safe in a remote and desolate, not to mention impractical, area of China. The cost to do this was staggering. It was running in the hundreds and hundreds of millions of yuan, or RMB, so this bright idea already had begun to drain China funds. 
So when the Cultural Revolution in 67, 68, and 69 began to ravage China's economy and production, it only exacerbated matters. Between the Third Front policies and the economic blowback of all the anarchy, China's economy really fell on hard times. By the end of 1969, it was obvious whatever steps had been taken to return to some degree of normalcy, nothing was working. So in February, they launched the One Strike, Three Anti campaign. The Yi Da San Fan. Da means to strike, as in strike down counter-revolutionary measures. The three antis, or San Fan, were calls against graft and embezzlement. Yeah, even a problem back then. Profiteering was the second, and extravagance and waste, the third. This... Yi Da San Fan campaign sort of opened up a very wide and far-reaching umbrella of ills that could be interpreted, you know, how you want it. The result was a very brutal local crackdown against you know, almost anyone. I mean, you could almost do anything and be accused of being a counter-revolutionary. What kind of a counter-revolutionary was in the eyes of the beholder? This One Strike Three anti-campaign went on into 1970 and 71, and in some parts uh, into 1972. All the local areas in China dutifully reported in their results, you know, how many arrested, how many executed, you know, for both political and or economic crimes. Well, it was all just an excuse to crack down on whatever class enemies might still be out there that you know, the first four to five years of the Cultural Revolution hadn't smashed yet. While this campaign ferreted out any undesirables out in the provinces, Mao turned his attention to the top leadership again. There were always more counter-revolutionaries to be smoked out. We're going to wind things down here for this episode by discussing something Lin Biao did that spelled the beginning of the end for him. As I mentioned before, China was on high alert for all of 1969. There was this constant fear of Soviet nuclear attack or invasion that was you know, not necessarily real, but made for great propaganda value to mobilize the masses and keep them on their toes and loyal to their leaders. Lin Biao went and did something that caused Mao to blow his top. In fear of a possible Soviet attack, timed to strike sometime around China's October 1st National Day celebration, this one being the 20th anniversary of the founding of the PRC, Lin decided to mobilize the military in response to this possible attack. Now, normally no big deal. After all, no one more than Mao kept pointing a finger at the Soviet Union and warning of the mischief these guys were always up to when it came to China. But Lin Biao made the colossal error of ordering this massive mobilization of the armed forces without going to the big man first. The attack on China didn't come on National Day, but that didn't stop Lin from issuing this directive on October 17th, you know, that called for this mobilization. Lin Biao went ahead and did this without asking Mao. Who knows why? Lin never did anything without clearing it through Mao first. Was he getting too cocky now that he was Mao's designated successor? Did he want to test Mao? Whatever the case, Mao Zedong was not happy, and this threw up a warning signal immediately. Mao saw how, on Lin's word alone, the military was able to respond quickly, and in no time at all, they were on the move to, you know, execute this order. Mao must have been thinking, geez, if Lin Biao wants to move against me, look how fast he can mobilize the PLA to move. If there weren't any seeds yet planted in Mao's head about Lin Biao's loyalty, this incident did the trick. So in this environment of hostility with the Soviet Union, both real and perceived, and then with Lin Biao's so-called First Order, where he went and mobilized the PLA without Mao's approval, Mao began to think how to cool things down with all the civil unrest and also lessen the existential threat from Russia. In doing this... Mao could take care of the higher objective of getting the PLA to get out of this battle siege frame of mind. And the wheels within wheels turning in Mao Zedong's head was already laying the foundation that would lead to Richard Nixon's visit to China in February of 1972. So next time we'll carry on with how that whole thing fit into the Cultural Revolution and what it means for China as we enter the 1970s. 
We've looked at 1966, 1967, 68, and 69 and saw how the whole thing unfolded. Now we're about to enter the 1970s. So, that's for next time. I'd like to give a special shout-out to my nephew, Gabraham, the 16th DJ. You know, of my entire family on eight continents, not a single one listens to the China History Podcast. I can't even get my kids to listen. The only one who listens, or says he does, is my nephew, Gabe, who just graduated from Kaohsiung last week and in two months is bound for the nation's capital where he will commence his studies at Georgetown University. So, a very happy graduation to my, my Wai Sheng. That's all for this time. This is your host and humble narrator, Laszlo Montgomery, signing off from, I kid you not, the Hotel Lucerna in the municipality of Mexicali, capital of Baja, California State, here south of the border in Mexico, checking out a few border factories, that's all, just spending the night, and back tomorrow to San Diego, where I parked my car, and then a mere two hours, and I'll be back in Claremont. More cultural revolution when we meet again. So, join me next time, won't you, for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.